Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. All viewers attending our interactive venues in Oxford, London, Newcastle, Wales, Toronto, Dhaka, Chiragong, Gothenburg, Weimar, Gottingen, Kassel, and Berlin, and Berlin, and our online viewers who are watching live from YouTube, ICSF Interactive Blog, and other partner blog sites, we welcome you all to this fourth episode of ICSF seminars. Uh, for this episode, uh, I am your moderator, Rahan Rashid. I am sending you my regards from Oxford. Today we are conducting the event collectively as a moderation panel with Ishtia Krof from Philadelphia, Ruman Mahamud from San Jose, Arman Rashid from Toronto, and Sam from Dhaka. Uh, I now give the microphone to Ishtia Krof uh, so that he can introduce ICSF and what we are about. Thank you. Uh Today's program is uh, arranged and hosted by the International Crimes uh, Strategy Forum, uh, ICSF in, in short. It is an um, independent global network of activists and organizations with membership um, across four continents. It is uh, an organization that is deeply committed to the spirit of uh, the historic liberation struggle of Bangladesh and to the spirit of justice. Um, ICSF was set up four years ago uh, to support the justice process in Bangladesh. The network is currently uh, engaged in campaign, uh, research, lobbying, documentation, archiving, opinion building, activists, uh, capacity building, and other civic um, engagement and activities. ICSF works both online and offline, and of course, including the social media. And uh, that is kind of a summary of what we do. And with that, uh, let's move on. Uh, and I hand it back to Rahan Rashid again. Thank you, Ishtiak. Uh, for this episode of the seminar, uh, our topic is uh, extraterritorial jurisdictions of the ICT, bringing the alleged war criminals back home. Uh, this is our topic. As you all may know, the ICT has recently uh, initiated the proceeding, initiated proceedings against two foreign nationals of Bangladeshi origin uh, for their alleged involvement in war crimes during the Liberation War in 1971. Uh, in today's discussion, we will focus on the legal, political, and the diplomatic challenges in extraditing them to Bangladesh so that they can face the charges against them in, before the International Crimes Tribunal. Uh, the primary goal of today's discussion is to have a sense of the proceedings that are ongoing against these alleged individuals, the justice campa campaign that led to the initi initiation of these proceedings. Uh, we'll, we'll also be looking at ICT's jurisdiction over foreign nationals, that is extraterritoriality, uh, legal and diplomatic challenges that are involved in the extradition as well as other possible alternatives we'd like to explore today. Uh, and, and finally, we will also look at uh, the due course for the activists and the justice campaigners and the civil society generally, that what can be done or what we should be doing. Uh, I hand it back to Ishtiak again. Um, thank you, um, Raihan. Um, today, um, in our panel discussions, we have uh, Gita Segal from the Center for Secular Space, and she will be joining us from London. We have uh, Mr. Jamal Hassan with us today. Uh, he is a terrorism and security expert. We also have uh, Advocate Ziad al Malum, uh, who is a prosecutor in the ICT, and he will be joining us from Dhaka. Mr. Malum will be uh, assisted by his colleagues, uh, Mr. Saiful Islam Tariq, uh, Barrister Tapush Kantibal on, on the panel, both of whom are honorable uh, prosecutors of the International Crimes uh, Tribunal of Bangladesh. From Dhaka, we also have a fellow ICSF member, uh, Barrister Shah Ali Farhad, um, as a discussion a discussant, and he has recently carried out extensive research on um, applicable extradition laws in UK and the US. And on behalf of ICSF um, and all the participants today, I, I welcome all the panel speakers. And I would like to thank them, of course, for joining us today. Uh, I know their schedule is very hectic, and we all really appreciate what they're doing for us. And in today's event, we also have many activists uh, joining us from all over the world. And we have currently uh, interactive venues with uh, activists joining us uh, from a number of cities. And we're broadcasting this program live uh, via YouTube. I believe a lot of us, a lot of you are following us through there. If you have any question, if you want to participate, and we really in, encourage you to participate, if you want to do that, please uh, go to Facebook, search for ICSF seminar, and go to the event page of this event, 
post your question there. A moderator will, uh, will pick it up and forward that to the discussions. Uh, you can also go to YouTube and use the hashtag ICSF22 June. That's for ICSF 22nd June. So go to YouTube and post your questions. Uh, sorry, go to Facebook, Twitter, post your questions, and a moderator will pick it up. And with that, I would now like to welcome one of my fellow moderators, uh, Ruman, to discuss the ground rules uh, for today's session and conduct the rest of the meeting. Thank you. We now go to San Jose. Thank you, Ishtiak. Uh, we are going to follow some ground rules strictly for moderator, uh, both the viewers and the honorable members, panel members. Uh, today's discussion will be strictly a technical and an academic one. We understand that it may be a very emotional issue for many of us, but we still need to restrain ourselves while talking about any alleged war criminals who are not convicted yet. Uh, we are not here to determine whether they are guilty or innocent. We are here to simply discuss the legal, political, and diplomatic barriers in extraditing them to Bangladesh to face trials. Now that a formal process is initiated in ICT, we need to assume that a person is innocent until proven guilty, being in line with the principle of presumption of innocence. Since this is a sub judicial matter, we are not going to talk about any specific allegation or any particular evidence in support of such allegations. We will only discuss the principles and processes. Now, I hand the mic back to Raihan Rashid. Uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, thank you for outlining uh, what are the ground rules, rules of today's discussion. As, 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 as she has already explained, that uh, uh, since the process has now been initiated, we'll be only looking at the proceedings and the process. And we are not here to determine anyone's guilt or innocence. Uh, we'll, we'll, just, we'll be just looking at the options, legal, political, and the diplomatic, that are involved here. The producer of the documentary, War Crimes Files, uh, uh, which was aired in the mid-90s, uh, from Channel Air, uh, Channel Four. Uh, so let's put our hands together in welcoming Ms. Geta Sagal, and let's uh, hear from her because she has been very much involved in Britain uh, in the campaign for justice, particularly for one of the uh, alleged war criminals now who, who is now being tried in, in Bangladesh. Uh, so let's hear from Geta. And Geta, thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rehan, for those kind words. Um, I'm very happy to join you today uh, in this discussion. Although I think it's going to be um, uh, quite a difficult discussion and quite a bleak discussion in some ways because the topic you have chosen to discuss the procedures um, and possibilities of extraterritorial jurisdiction, um, I mean, it, it contains many possibilities but also many, many limitations. And I, I hope that we'll be able to, um, you know, honestly discuss both sides, the possibilities and the limitations today. Now, um, as we uh, described, uh, we're not going to go into details around the allegations uh, uh, around um, in, in, in the case of St. George Moyuddin or Ashraf Zaman Khan, whose cases have been brought before the tribunal. But what I do want to say is that as a producer of the War Crimes File, I believe that the allegations uh, that um, have come to the tribunal are serious and credible allegations. And uh, I'm very glad that, the, that there is a process going on uh, where these allegations will be heard uh, in, in uh, a court. Um, and I think that is, um, we cannot underestimate uh, the struggle that it's taken to get these to court. And I, I want to make a few remarks that some of you will be very familiar with, but in the hope that we may gain new audiences for this, I want to make a few general remarks um, uh, around the issue of uh, these processes and, and, and international justice. One um, issue that has come up repeatedly from opponents of the tribunal and the lobby that is the, the public relations lobby that is defending um, uh, uh, the, uh, the defendants before the tribunal is that the uh, people who are being brought before the tribunal are purely being brought before for political reasons not for reasons uh, uh, connected with justice or for allegations of serious crimes. Um, I think this is something that we need to address because, and I, and I want to address it in a very personal way, 
Because when we began to do the investigation that led to the war crimes file, and my colleague who worked with me on this um, was David Bergman, who many of you know, and many of you I know have uh, uh, disagreements with some of his issues. But when we began to address this, um, this issue, we were not addressing it from the point of view of looking for leaders of any political party or anything like that. We simply were led by the allegations that existed and were known in the community. And we had to follow and do a lot of digging in order to follow a chain of evidence that had existed since 1971. I think that's really important. And actually, when I first started this work, I fully expected that we would not, you know, we would find that people had changed their names and so on as Nazi war criminals had done and that they were in hiding. And actually, what we found was that they were living in plain sight, still embracing the same politics that they had embraced in the past, that is the politics of the jamaat e islami and that they continue to do so today. So that issue, I believe, is a very crucial uh, thing to remember, that, we, that when, the, when the war crimes file was made, it was not made with any intention of uh, looking at leaders. It was made with the intention of seeing whether allegations that were known in the community could be substantiated. Um, and, and from the point of view of uh, filmmaking, certainly, um, we believe we uh, produced uh, a good film. Now, going on from there, what happened was that we handed a dossier of the allegations to uh, Scotland Yard. Now, why did we do that? Why did we hand the dossier to people in Britain of crimes committed very, very far away? The reason was that the whole premise of the war crimes file was that there was an act in Britain, the War Crimes Act, that had been passed, which allowed for the prosecution of war crimes which had been committed abroad. And that is what is te technically known as extraterritorial jurisdiction. And that is a great advance in international law which, which deems that some crimes are so serious that even if they're committed uh, in another country or long ago, that they can still be prosecuted if the perpetrators are present in uh, another country. They can be prosecuted on the soil of that country. So some countries have passed legislation that allows this to happen, and Britain was one of those countries. This was in the uh, early to mid-90s. So, and at that time, the issue of extraterritorial jurisdiction, the issue of the international court and so on, it was in a, in a very fledgling stage. We have to realize that the war crimes file was made before the Rwanda and Yugoslav tribunals, which are two great international tribunals set up by the international community after major genocidal wars, uh, before they had made any judgments. They were simply in the process of being set up at that time. And none of the um, law that has been made since then, international law, had yet been made. So it was a, at a very early stage these things were handed to Scotland Yard. Now the unit over there was a very, very small unit. And uh, we really didn't hear anything from them. And eventually, when people inquired, actually the inquiries came from Bangladesh, from human rights activists, they, they, they basically got answers that said, look, um, there has been no uh, complaint made by the government, and therefore, uh, you know, we're really not going to pursue this. Um, so, in effect, uh, there wasn't at that time the political will, uh, even though the legislative um, requirement had been met uh, in British law, the political will actually undermined, or the lack of political will undermined the legislation. Uh, so they could not, you know, Scotland Yard was not keen to take it up because there wasn't a government request. And, uh, of course, that has changed, and I'm sure you're going to discuss uh, the, the, the issues around that later. Later, there was um, a policeman from Bangladesh who tried to do a little bit of investigation, but uh, I don't think that he got very much assistance um, in, in doing that. And what that shows us is that there needs to be a very widespread uh, demand in order to even create the political will to have any kind of inquiry or investigation taking place. And 
in Britain, uh, we can see this in a whole series of cases, whether we're talking about an individual murder that is taking place in this country, like Stephen Lawrence, or whether we're talking about the cover-up of police brutality that took place in the football stadiums, known as the Hillsborough disaster, when many football fans died. Uh, uh, we're really talking about years and years, decades of campaigning by relatives for justice. So you can imagine how much harder it is when you're not even talking about people who are necessarily in Britain, but, but victims' families abroad who are carrying out that um, campaign for justice. Now, I want to, so that's one of the reasons I think legally it's been um, quite difficult uh, to, to get anywhere in this country, even though law exists that persuades that, that allows things to happen. Um, there is another, I, I want to turn to a broader issue, which I think is, is extremely relevant. And that is the British government policy, or set of policies, which have actually guaranteed, in effect, virtual impunity to members of the Jamaat Islami resident in this country. Now, what do I mean by saying this, by virtual impunity? That I mean that there is not only a reluctance to investigate because there hasn't been a government request, but I think now, uh, in 2013, there will be a huge reluctance to examine the past histories and serious allegations against people resident in this country because they have been so close to um, everybody from royalty to um, prime ministers uh, to local councils and so on. And in order to... Um, examine their role, we would actually be examining the uh, nice of British domestic and foreign policy. I think this policy can be summed up very simply. It says, really, a lot of British government policy has relied on the old saying, keep your enemies, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Now, enemies in this case have been of course, during the war on terror, the Al-Qaeda network, uh, what are known as technically the Salafi jihadis, uh, whom the British government has been um, uh, rendering abroad to the United States, who their allegations that the British state has been involved in torture, uh, has uh, sometimes found people in this country, disrupted crops, and also specifically under the rule of law. So there has been a huge emphasis on what's been happening to Salafi Jihadis and the threat that they pose. Uh, those are the enemies. The friends are the jamaat e islami and the Muslim Brotherhood, whom the government has used strategically in order to um, uh, uh, forward uh, their own control of the Muslim population of this country and also of the they hoped and believed would help them disrupt terrorist plots and so on. I think this policy has been really developing since um, 1989 with the Rushdie affair. And if we look on a channel called Secular Zone, in which uh, there are some old films of mine uh, around the issue of Salman Rushdie and blasphemy, and um, a discussion, an online uh, a, a discussion that we had that we put online called. Um, uh, uh, Bangladesh genocide, what human rights and peace and other organizations won't tell you. Uh, we look at the ways in which um, very many different forms of fundamentalists mobilized during the Rushdie affair. So in the discussion on uh, the Bangladesh genocide, Dr. Giyasuddin Siddiqui described how he, who at that time was pro-Iranian, went and advocated for the fatwa against Rushdie from the Iranian government. But one of the people that he worked with was Jozmi Moinuddin, who was active in mobilizing Muslims, including many pious Bangladeshi Muslims, uh, around the issue of the battle. And what we heard very clearly from Dr. Siddiqui is how they used the piety of Muslims and um, uh, manipulated it in order to get Barelvis and many groups who uh, were not themselves fundamentalists to be angry that the honor of the Prophet had been um, uh, affected by the satanic forces. And what we see really is the politics 
of the pro-Iranian faction of fundamentalists and the politics of the pro-Saudi faction of fundamentalists being played out on the streets of Britain and mobilizing um, British Muslims. And the irony of this is that what happened later was that the British government decided to choose one side of this, the pro-Saudi side, as their allies when they advised them to set up the Muslim Council of Britain and the jamaat e islami emerged as the leaders of an umbrella body, the Muslim Council of Britain, uh, of British Muslims. The pro-Iranian faction, uh, represented by Dr. Siddiqui at that time, uh, a man called Kaleem Siddiqui, who mentored, mentor, uh, who mentored Dr. Siddiqui, the Muslim Parliament, Muslim Institute, and so on, were marginalized. And of course, the further uh, irony of all this is that they eventually became uh, a voice for reform and put aside the uh, vicious politics that they had been uh, involved with, whereas the Muslim Council of Britain, which received um, backing from the government and had access to taxpayers' money and so on, uh, was uh, 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 you know, the, the primary um, body that the British government wanted to deal with. Now, a lot of this became, uh, we knew a lot of this already, but a very brave man called Derek Baskin, who was a civil servant, uh, risked his career uh, and his, his health, really, uh, and, and uh, 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 faced arrest and a trial because he became a whistleblower. He was a civil servant who became a whistleblower. And he sent to a journalist documents dealing with rendition on the one hand, and on the other hand, information from within the Home and Foreign Office about how the, both the jamaat e islami and the Muslim Brotherhood were being promoted by sections of the British state. And as one ambassador said, that the British state was beginning to confuse engaging with Islam or engaging with Muslims with engaging with Islamists. And he was tried for these documents. And eventually the trial collapsed because in fact British, it was shown during the course of the trial that British policy had changed as a result of these documents being exposed and there was a genuine public interest uh, in, in what he did. He wasn't part, for instance, of a, of a, a, a what pretended to be a public interest exposure, which is actually a corporate attack or something like that. He did it um, at the risk of uh, his own job uh, because he wanted to improve, uh, to, to expose two sets of atrocities. And one, uh, the renditions issue, was taken up by the human rights movement. And indeed, it's become one of the great human rights issues of our time, is to expose the issue of renditions flights, and torture and illegal detention and so on of, of terrorist suspects. However, the other issue uh, has not been taken up by the human rights movement, at, but it was exposed in, uh, by a, 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 a conservative leaning a, a think tank, Policy Exchange, written by a lecturing journalist who couldn't get access to any left think tank to publish. That was Martin Bright, who was, uh, had been political editor of the New Statesman and also of the Observer. And he wrote a crucial piece called uh, uh, When Progressives Treat with Reactionaries, in which he discussed, um, uh, uh, he exposed the various discussions taking place at internal level in the foreign, and, uh, uh, foreign office, foreign commonwealth office, and in the home office. Now, um, I'm sure that there are going to be many questions. We've started very late, so I want to um, uh, end there. Uh, but just to say that the task that faces the tribunal, uh, and not just the tribunal, but the social movements associated with justice and accountability, is a very big one, because Chaudhry Moinuddin's career, for instance, as a, a prominent British Muslim, who has vigorously denied the allegations against him, um, has, has never suffered as a result of having these allegations there. He's risen through various uh, jobs, for instance, in um, housing associations, to his, uh, the current position that he stepped aside from when these allegations were published, uh, uh, because, uh, because they came before the tribunal. Uh, they were published in this country after many years of silence when um, there were threats of um, libel risks against anybody who wanted to republish any of the allegations that had originally made of the war crimes file. 
Um, so, so because of that, um, journalists in this country were silenced, bloggers were silenced, um, nobody made any further documentaries about it. Um, but Chaudhry Moiduddin went on to a, su a successful career as one of the founders of um, the Islamic Forum Europe, involved with senior positions in the Muslim Council of Britain, um, involved with um, uh, uh, eventually as a head of spiritual care for Muslims in a charity that uh, delivered uh, 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 care uh, across the NHS, uh, uh, spiritual care. And that says as much about um, not just of Britain's counter-terrorism policy, but the way in which its attitude to minorities has focused on promoting fundamentalist leaders uh, in order to see them as uh, people who can control their community, a sort of multi-faith policy that has replaced its old flawed policy of multiculturalism has been replaced by an even more flawed one uh, of multi-faithism. Um, so the, the issue that we're dealing with today, while it's a very um, legal issue, also affects the way in which Britain's soft counter-terrorism policies of working with um, uh, fundamentalist Muslim leaders um, uh, 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 on the one hand, and also its other broader social policies of um, uh, uh, using this, uh, uh, instead of using the state to provide services, more and more depending on charities, and many of them with fundamentalists in very senior positions in them. So we've got a very, very big um, uh, task on our hands because these policies have broadly been accepted. They started with the Labour government, but we've seen that they haven't really changed that much under the Conservatives or the Liberal Democrats. And indeed, uh, people who've advocated for uh, Saidi, for instance, have stood as Liberal Democrat candidates in one, in, in one case. So, um, you know, we, we, we see the influence of not, not just the politics of the Jamaat, but apologists for the defendants in these trials, and even those who've been convicted. Um, and uh, it, it's going to be a very long, hard battle to overturn that. I think there's just one more thing that I want to say, and I think, because I think we really do need to address it, that personally, I mean, we're going to hear more on extradition, but personally, I think it's going to be hard to argue for extradition because of the issue of the death penalty. And because there's been a popular movement that has promoted the death penalty and the government has seen, been, um, uh, at one stage, seemed to be very willing to listen to that voice. So I think we've got a hard task against us. But I think it is an important issue to address. And it's an important issue to get the, uh, to, to, to have the trials so that the allegations that are there simply as allegations can be proved, and so that the issues that we're dealing with, which affect both Bangladesh and Britain, and as we're, I'm sure, going to hear the US and other countries as well, can actually be put before the public, not merely as allegations eventually, but as something that has actually uh, been heard in a court of law. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Segal, for sharing the interesting experience with us. Uh, it seems like we have some questions for you, but uh, right now I'm going to ask only two questions. Uh, these questions are from Raihan Rashid uh, from Oxford. The first question is, uh, what was the aftermath of war crimes file documentary in UK? Any significant development since then? If yes, then what are they, and if not, why do you think so? And the second question is, why on principle do you think UK government should cooperate with Bangladesh government? Yeah. Um, I, I tried to explain the issue of the aftermath. There was a huge activist aftermath of the documentary in that uh, there were many screenings, there were screenings in Bangladesh, there were screenings in this country, it was taken um, uh, all over the country in Bangladesh, uh, and, and, and in, indeed all over the country here, in front of many, many audiences. And indeed people who had maybe followed Chaudhry Moinuddin trustingly into demonstrations against um, uh, Salman Rushdie, 
were appalled by the findings of um, the war crimes file documentary. However, on the part of the state, although the government was given a dossier, uh, uh, of, uh, or, or several dossiers, in fact, of, of uh, uh, the allegations contained in the war crimes file, um, the Scotland Yard said that they, 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 they uh, weren't going to um, uh, respond unless they had a request from the Bangladesh government. Now, I think if we jump ahead now to this period, where there may well be a request from the Bangladesh government, I think we have another set of complications. So to go to your second question, should the UK government cooperate with Bangladesh? Indeed, there should be cooperation with Bangladesh. But, but I think that if we look at the cases of uh, various people that the government has been trying to extradite to the US with full government backing, for instance, Abu Hamza, on the one hand, or um, uh, Abu Qatada, whose uh, extradition to Jordan has been under question. Um, it has been really, really difficult to extradite these people, even though, in these cases, the US government, and the, on, the, and the, on the one hand, and the Jordanian government on the other, are in agreement with the British government that these extraditions should take place. And yet, the, the legal procedures have been such uh, uh, and the concern with torture um, uh, in, in the case of Abu Qatada being extradited to Jordan, that it has taken many, 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 many years uh, in order to um, move, move with uh, those requests. With the result that uh, the people who are under, uh, under question have been held in British jails for many years. Now, my question actually to the British government on many of those cases would be, why didn't they try them in Britain? Now, and that question may come up with some people who might say, why not try Chaudhry Moinudin in Britain under the laws that would allow him to be tried here? And I think there, there would be actually uh, many different answers to that. And in this case, the British government would say, because a forum in Bangladesh, the ICT has already indicted him. So on the one hand, that trial may, you know, the British government would now use that as the reason why there wouldn't be a trial here. On the other hand, even though there, 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 there would be a, there's an ongoing um, the question of indictments is ongoing in Bangladesh, uh, they might still say, but we're not going to extradite. Or even if the government agreed, which I don't think the government could agree because of the death penalty, and I think a court would not agree because of the death penalty. I think we have to be really clear about that. Because I know that the, the issue of the death penalty has been such an emotional issue as part of the arguments for justice in Bangladesh. Uh, thank, thanks again, Geeta Sagal. Uh, I think we'll uh, we have a few more questions, and we hope to come back to during our uh, during our detailed Q A session towards the end of the program. Uh, now, uh, I think we, we can now move on to Mr. Jamal Hassan, uh, who is based in Washington, D.C. Uh, as we have already released, he's a terrorism and security expert uh, and analyst, everyone's benefit. Mr. Hassan has been a very vocal activist in, in, in USA, and he has been very instrumental in, uh, in the campaign of one of the, uh, one of, one of the, one of the alleged war criminals uh, who is now residing in USA. Uh, uh, and, and we'd like to actually hear more. Because there, he he lobbied with the U.S. government and and lobbied with the Bangladesh government as well, and 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 through his work and through the works of his colleagues, uh, uh, we can say that uh, there, was, there have been some improvements and some developments, and which we can see uh, through the through the current proceedings. So uh, Jamal Hassan, uh, we'd like to hear more from uh, from you about that, about the whole what what happened and and how 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 things proceeded and where, where things are now at the moment. Uh, if you want to hear the chronology of the events, in the 1972, Bangladesh newspapers published. Uh, I was a university student at the time, so uh, there was a you know newspaper stories about the alleged war criminal Ashraf Zaman Khan. When I think at the time he was Islamic Chhatra Shangha student and probably a student of Dhaka University. So it was like a, he, he uh, apparently the papers, I think, as they remember, that they said that the, the gentleman and the alleged war criminal left Bangladesh and, uh, you know, uh, with a picture of the young, you know, young Ashok Zaman Khan's young, the pictures were printed in most of the papers. 
So at the time I promised myself, actually I was in Bangladesh, I never thought of coming to USA. I mean, <laughs> I, I promised to myself that someday I'll do something, at least a, a work in, in apprehending him. Anyway, I came to the USA later on, and in 1994, I was in Florida, so I didn't have any clue at the time that uh, in 1994 that he was in the USA. So uh, there was a, a Prabashi paper, it was a, uh, a, an ethnic Bengali paper from New York, it published a news story about Sharia Kabir, activist friend. He was in New York and he uh, said that uh, this, uh, this gentleman is living in, uh, in New York and nothing is happening. So, um, I was uh, kind of shocked that he was in the USA and I didn't, didn't know about it. So um, I, I, I sent uh, comments, to, uh, inquiries to my friends, uh, associates in New York, and they um, uh, gave me the uh, whereabouts of this, uh, this alleged uh, war criminal. And I, I was trying to see something if we can do. Uh, but it was very difficult, of course, because of, by the time he, he probably became resident or, C, uh, or US citizen. So in 1999, when I moved to uh, DC metropolitan area where I am based, so um, uh, I I joined the U.S. Justice Department, and so I had a good opportunity to network with the uh, Office of Special Investigation Chief Eli Rosenbaum, who at the time was dealing with mainly Nazi war criminals. At, at the time, OSI of the Justice Department had no jurisdiction to prosecute or extradite any war criminal other than. The Second World War criminal, uh, alleged war criminals. So even then, I had a meeting, and uh, obviously, as I was an insider, if I would be outsider, I wouldn't have the chance to meet such a high, high profile of, official from US government. So I had a meeting, I remember it was a historical meeting. There was a, uh, all, all these attorneys and also the sheriff and all this. And, but I brought some uh, paperwork, and I basically brought the Ekaturi Ghatuk Dalal Ke Pothaba Sharir Kabir, I think the English version. And um, I, I remember that the, those, uh, they, they had no clue at the time. U.S. officials had no clue about what was going on in Bangladesh in 1971. They had no clue about war crime. They had no clue about genocide. So luckily, uh, that meeting actually sowed the seed of uh, the knowledge of Bangladesh atrocities by Pakistani army, what happened in 71. So they had a historian, and they, they ultimately built up a cell on Bangladesh war crime. And uh, later on, I think in 2009, a Bangladeshi American student got the internship, uh, the subject of Bangladesh genocide, which is quite encouraging, uh, I mean, I can say development. And I think early 2000, uh, Congress passed a bill which basically gave a bigger jurisdiction to the Justice Department, OSI, to, uh, to apprehend any war criminal. It could be from uh, Ru Rwanda or it could be from anywhere, Bangladesh or Haiti. And uh, as a matter of fact, that also encouraged uh, the activists like us. So in 1999, uh, when I was uh, still working with the justice, I had a meeting with the uh, Ididan ambassador, uh, Shehabuddin, I remember, and uh, ambassador uh, from Bangladesh. And he promised that uh, our meeting uh, proceedings would be transmitted to uh, the then prime minister at the time the uh, Awami League was in power and prime minister Sheikh Hasina. It was the, I can say, first uh, uh, I mean, first has seen a term, I can say. And as far as I know, our uh, friend uh, from Belgium, associate activist friend, uh, Barrister Ahmed Ziauddin also uh, met with the Prime Minister has Sheikh Hasina and said that uh, about our activism and if there is a possibility of extraditing or uh, he to uh, Mr. Alleged War Criminal to Bangladesh. But I remember that at the time, Prime Minister said that our parliament, our, post, our, our basically position is very weak, and maybe the next election we can do. Unfortunately, the next election, which came, uh, uh, Mr. Khan's, uh, Mr. Khan's allies came to power, and there was no chance. Even then, even then, we had constantly we had meetings with the justice, and justice was interested. And I remember in 1999. Uh, INS, uh, one uh, INS colleague, uh, I mean, Immigration and Naturalization Co uh, Services colleague, Tom Fusi, told me that if Bangladesh becomes forthcoming, we will be able to extra extradite him. And in uh, America, uh, you know, that uh, sometimes it doesn't have to, you don't have to prove that you did a war, I mean, a war crime. Yeah, but if you can, if somebody can prove that some uh, one American citizen in the visa application, uh, a concocted story or uh, suppress the story that he kills people, and if there's one or two witness, uh, I mean, credible witness, 
who becomes uh, you know uh, I mean, who come, becomes forthcoming and, 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 and sort of links with the justice and if it is can proven that he had uh, sort of uh, t made a wrong uh, I mean, uh, statement in the, his application he can be extradited and extradition we know the case of uh, for example con convicted in Bangladesh court uh, left -hand, I mean, for Bangabandhu murder case, Lieutenant Colonel Mohyuddin A.K. Ahmed. That was a historical uh, event, I can say, because in USA does not do so quickly an ex extraditing, but it was, a, it was also encouraging for us. But we knew that he actually opted for political asylum, and he said, uh, obviously, in his plea that uh, in Bangladesh there's a capital punishment and he would be executed. And uh, luckily, U USA is not Canada or UK, where capital punishment is not um, an, a rare phenomenon. Still now, there are a lot of capital punishments. Anyway, what I want to say that I wrote an article uh, on Ashraf Zaman Khan, the gentleman who was uh, alleged to be the killer of seven university teachers. It was published in 1999, and it was in the web. And that actually drew attention of uh, various law enforcement agencies, like New York Police Department, uh, actually got in touch with me in 2004. And New York Police Department Intelligence Bureau, as Miss, uh, I'm just giving a little briefing that uh, Ms. Shegal has said about UK, Muslim Brotherhood and um, other situation in UK. In USA, Muslim Brotherhood is uh, very active. But uh, in USA, after 9-11, the situation has totally changed. I think many local law enforcement agencies are monitoring Islamist groups are in. I do not know, I cannot say why NYPD was interested in uh, Mr. Khan. But NYPD was closely in touch with me and they basically asked me, it's a historical thing, I, I should tell they asked me to uh, just link them up with the Justice Department. So in 2005, March, I coordinated a meeting between the NYPD Intelligence Bureau and OSI, that's Office of Special Investigation of Justice Department. And that actually paved the way how sometimes, you know, local agency and federal agency, they don't talk to each other. It, it is a common phenomenon, even in the last uh, case, uh, Boston bombing, you know, the, all, the marathon bombing, that was also the case when the local police did not talk to the FBI before. And it's still being, uh, it's still in the press, uh, you know, congressmen are criticizing why it's not the issue. But it's an uh, old story of turf, you know. And 2007, FBI showed interest also in Ashraf Zaman Khan, and FBI also contacted me. And that, uh, I don't know, I mean, that probably the, uh, uh, another result of the article. That, that also proves how the internet uh, plays a strong role, uh, which we see in the Shabab movement. Anyway, so um, I was in touch with one of the ICT prosecutors, uh, and, and it was, uh, I was lucky that I knew him before, before he became the prosecutor. It was an unusual circumstance and, and a lot of coincidences. Anyway, so he, when he became the prosecutor and he came and obviously we are very close and we had meetings and I was insisting that he should directly link up with the U.S. officials. I was trying my heart, my very best. When I remember Shamsul Haq Tuku came, I think he's the State Minister of uh, Home Affairs to USA. I also urged, but things don't happen that way. It's very difficult sometimes to make the Bangladeshi uh, government, or especially the ministers, to be as aggressive as you ICSF people or we ICSF people, or like I mean, they might they have other other agendas, but uh, war crime issue could be one of the agendas. But it is not that they would be the dedicated activists like us, because they are actually gov uh, I mean, I mean elected uh, ministers. I would say selected ministers by the uh, certain government. So anyway, it was an encouraging thing that uh, the current Bangladesh ambassador to USA, Akramul Kader, he is an, I mean, I found him like he's an activist. And he's not like a typical bureaucrat. So, uh, so I can say that he, uh, maybe a year ago, he arranged a meeting between the ICT prosecutor and uh, the OSI chief, Eli Rosenbaum. And I hope they have more uh, direct uh, communication now and I am hopeful that something can come out. So on the one hand, local agencies like NYPD, FBI, they are all watching, but whatever, and, uh, but it, it, it seems sometimes to like, who will build a cat? So that is my final thing, who will build a cat? So um, one thing that if ICT has really witnesses, 
Fujita OSI was insisting during the BNP uh, administration was when they were in power. OSI people said that even the Bang even the Bangladesh government is pro Jamaat or pro Ashabazaman Khan, the alleged criminal, uh, alleged, alleged mass murderer. But if there are uh, credible witnesses, they can even arrange a meeting in Calcutta. So anyway, that, that, that we don't need now. We are so you know we are um, as we understand the government of Bangladesh is already in the field, already uh, you know indicted the uh, alleged war criminals, and uh, if U.S. government and Bangladesh, if, if both the party comes to a conclusion, I mean like they, let's do it. And from U.S. side, I can say U.S. will never prosecute any alleged war criminal because in the dominion of or many of the Nazi war criminals. Uh, gladly denaturalize the person, that means his U.S. citizenship will be revoked, and he would be basically kicked out, the, out of the country. But USA does not do prosecute war criminals. So even if he, uh, even uh, any alleged war criminals is extradited, that's a very good, uh, I mean, very good uh, event. And in, in USA, there's movement, of course, like as Ms. Shegal said, and there is a big great movement about anti-Islamist uh, I mean, groups. Because then many uh, many uh, many activists in USA, starting from congressmen to grassroots movement, I mean they are fighting against global jihad, and they uh, many of them have the assumption that some of the Islamist leaders are tied to um, the, the you know, global uh, jihad network. So there I end my point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamal Hassan Bhai. Uh, that was indeed a very informative account and. Of course, an inspiring one of the campaign and lobbying history uh, regarding Ashraf Jamal Khan that went on. Uh, the point on interagency tar for or lack of coordination that was very interesting actually. Uh, I guess this is how some alleged war criminals sometimes slip the net. Uh, uh, there are a few questions, uh, actually, quite a lot of questions we are receiving. Uh, mm -hmm. People are actually wanting to ask you. Uh, uh, Ishtia Crow Ishti from uh, the, from Philadelphia. He will he will ask. He will start with the two questions. Uh, before that, I also have one question I'd like to add. Uh, wh what? How do you uh, how do you think the issue of uh, Islamophobia play uh, when 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 you talk about justice uh, in the USA against these uh, alleged individuals? Uh, so that was my question. I think Ishtia Crow will will be adding two more, and then we'd like to hear briefly from you on those questions. Islamophobia is a totally, um, basically, I mean, I, I mean, negative connotation. I mean, I can say, <laughs> I mean, negative term. Obviously, I, I cannot say it's Islam. It's a, it's a pragmatic approach. It's a, if uh, you know, if we, if U.S. law enforcement agency just keep their eyes shut, because I, I can tell you one thing. When uh, Qadir Mullah, uh, I remember Qadir Mullah or somebody came to USA. There are some local in law enforcement agencies were inquiring about it. Mir Kashimali, obviously Homeland Security was interested. It, it's not a question of Islamophobia because they have proof. They have proof that, uh, that uh, some of the Jamaati uh, groups, I mean Jamaati supporters in USA or even the Jamaati leaders from Bangladesh could have tested linkage with uh, certain jihadi networks or questionable characters. And USA, I mean, I don't want to name uh, groups, but in the USA, there are so-called, uh, you know, human rights group under the guise of, uh, I mean, uh, some Islamist groups under the guise of human rights organizations. And there are some individuals in those groups had, uh, you know, became at mean, one time co-conspirators in certain terror plots. And uh, they were indicted. I mean, they were even indicted. So it is, it is the reality in USA. It is the reality that unfortunately many of the Islamist leaders, uh, not, not all, I mean, they sometimes in their oratory or something, they uh, they they sometimes uh, espouse certain things which are and goes contradictory to uh, values of secular and modern societies, and not necessarily that is the violent jihad. They espouse violent jihad. So, so I, I'm saying, if you if you just say that because somebody is Muslim, no. If you say because certain individual, it could be a, a, some. A, Obviously, Mr. Ashraf Zaman Khan was uh, was a leader of Islamic circle of North America, and I, as far as I know, uh, not other leaders are so closely watched. 
Uh, definitely, there are some hints. Obviously, now you hear about National Security Agency and all these things, but I mean, I don't want to go on, on the detail, but if there is some kind of suspicion, definitely there will be court order, and as far as I know, FBI generally does not monitor anybody without any ground rule, I mean, without any legal authority. That much I can say. Mike is on now. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm asking these first, and some follow-ups I'll save for later. Uh, the first question is the issue of death penalty. We know that um, in many European countries it is a major issue that countries or activists are largely against this process because they are against um, death penalty. Uh, you know, it's part of their moral principle. But we know that in the US uh, death penalty is allowed uh, and does that change the scenario for us uh, in the case of, you know, alleged war criminal criminals who are in the U.S., um, does the issue of extradition, you know, complicate things in any way? So that's my first question. I'll move on to the next one later on. Uh, is there a question addressed to me or uh, yes, yes, no, sorry, yeah, address oh, you. Okay, sure. okay. Uh, in the U.S., it's not a problem, and you know, you know that in Canada yeah. there was alleged uh, alleged murderer of Bangabandhu, and uh, who was probably convicted in Bangladeshi court. He will never be. Uh, so, I mean, he will never, I mean, leave Canada because Canadian government will always give him shelter because of the situation, the death penalty. Canada does not pursue death penalty. In USA, it is not a problem. And, and that's why I'm saying that uh, with the AK Mohyuddin, mm -hmm. that guy was living in USA for a long time, and of course his son uh, was a get, a, a, a get a lobbyist for his father. And uh, he, he even got uh, in, in some of the congressmen in his pocket, but even then, they failed. Ninth Circuit Court did not uh, listen to his plea for political asylum, and U.S. government ultimately deported him to Bangladesh, where he was later hanged. We all know, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mahyuddin A.K. Muhammad. So, um, uh, actually, because USA does not have any problem with the death penalty, so, you know, not all all states. Do, yeah. I think you might be aware. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. states, Some maybe states, problem. Exactly. I, I think majority states probably uh, support death penalty, not all. And yes. recently, Maryland, a Maryland governor has, you know, you know, uh, wanted to uh, actually, actually sort of ban death penalty in Maryland. Mm -hmm. But but U.S. government, I think federal government doesn't don't don't doesn't have any problem. So. So that's why it is not a problem uh, if Bangladesh government really decides to execute somebody. So it will not be a problem on US government's part. But UK, I cannot really say about UK. Because, yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah. a different issue. Uh, which which also uh, brings me to the second question that I had because uh, you mentioned uh, the issue of uh, you know denaturalization for naturalized citizens. We know that anyone who's a naturalized citizen can, of course, their citizenship can be taken away. Um, in that case. Uh, what really needs to be done? What is the criteria? How much do we have to do to um, make sure that uh, there's denaturalization or extradition uh, to, to get that from the US government? Uh, could you share a little bit of that detail so that we could, you know, that would definitely help us activists? I do not, um, primarily, I do not know all the details how, like, uh, Nazi war criminals cases are basically resolved, like Damien, I do not know. If, um, but as far as I as as far as I heard, I mean, I, maybe I saw some somewhere, maybe one witness. You don't need hundreds of witnesses. One witness came forward. I do not know if uh, the justice people went to Ukraine, but I but as 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 much as know that uh, there was a credible witness, definitely. I do not also know if that witness could testify that he saw Demianuk kill some people. But that particular witness might have testified in certain court, or you know, in, or in front of law enforcement people, that Demianu was a guard in a in a detention center where people were killed. I mean, maybe that would be enough. Okay, so um, I, I do not know all the details of U.S. law. I mean, how how it proceeds in case of deporting war criminals or alleged war criminals. But you probably know the aftermath that he was deported. Ukrainian-born Demianuk was deported to Germany, where he finally died, because German government also German government indicted him. So German government might have some evidence. In Bangladesh, I I, I know that Chaudhry Moinuddin and Mr. Chaudhry Moinuddin 
UK citizen and Mr. Ashrafuzzaman Khan, US citizen. I am confident that there are living witnesses in Bangladesh. Now the question is in Bangla, what is how do you batebole act for Ben Kibabe? How do you tie the bat and ball in cricket? You know, how do you do that? So, you know, already I know that there was a matchmaking done, uh, done between U.S. Justice and Bangladesh Justice, or Bangladesh ICT and U.S. Justice Department. So, uh, you know, so we can just, you know, keep our, you know, keep on hoping. So th that much I can tell. Thank you. Um, I just hand it over to uh, Ruman now. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Hassan. Uh, we will come back to you during the during our Q and A session at the end of the program. But now we will move to Dhaka Venue and invite Mr. Ziyadul Malum to speak on behalf of the team of ICT prosecutors. Please uh, welcome uh, Mr. Malum. Mr. Tapos, I think, will be speaking first. Um, I think the order changed. But in any, in, okay. in, any, in any case, we're going to Dhaka now. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to Dhaka to speak with the uh, team of ICT prosecutors. Uh, I think, uh, let me, uh, before we go to the Dhaka, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, our honorable prosecutors who actually made time today to join us. Uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today uh, uh, Mr. Ziadul Malum. He, he he is in charge of the administration of uh, of the uh, the prosecution team of the International Crimes Tribunal. Uh, he is accompanied by uh, Tapos Kantibal. Uh, he is a he is a barrister uh, and a very young one actually. Uh, and Tapos had been a human rights activist uh, before he joined the ICT. Uh, he studied in Britain, and. And we also have with us today uh, our prosecutor, uh, Saiful Islam Tarek. He's an advocate. Uh, so we are very lucky to have uh, have them here today with us. Uh, so uh, back to you, Dhaka. Uh, uh, I think Sam Sam will pick up uh, or Ruman maybe. Uh, let, let's hear from them uh, first. Uh, let, let us hear from Tapush Kanti Baul. He'll be presenting uh, on behalf of the ICT about the proceedings against the two alleged individuals and uh, where the case is and, and what are the next stages. Uh, 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 let us all uh, welcome Tapush Kanti Baul. Thank you, Ramre. I'm handing over the mic to Mr. Tapush Pal. Thank you and good evening to everyone. Uh, I will be uh, submitting about the facts of the case, which has been recently, uh, the prosecution has submitted the formal charge against uh, Ashraf Zaman Khan and Chaudhuri Mainuddin. And then I will speak about the procedural history. And then uh, my senior colleague, uh, Mr. Malum, will be uh, submitting about charges against them rules and procedure on absentia trial. And then uh, my another senior colleague, Mr. Tarek, will speak about the arrest warrant. First, uh, about the facts of the case, which has been sub which was submitted by the prosecution, is in uh, 1971. Uh, first of all, I will be speaking about Ashraf Zaman Khan, that you all know that in uh, 1971, he, uh, Mr. Ashraf Zaman Khan, alias Naib Ali Khan, was a student and was one of the central committee member of the Chhatra Shongho, the student wing of Daden Jamati Islami. During the Liberation War, he was a high command member of the notorious Al Badr force. He was the chief executor of the infamous intellectual killing in 1971, prior to our Independence Day. He took the leading role in these killings as a key member of the Al Badr. He was the commander. He was the commander of the Ghazi Salauddin Ayubi Company of the Al Badr. On the other hand, on the other hand, accused Choudhury Mainuddin, alias Mojnu Choudhury, was a student of Bengali Department of the University of Dhaka be before 1971. And he was working as a journalist of the Daily Purbodesh, a renowned newspaper of 1971. He was a very obedient activist. I would rather say he was a keen activist of Chhatra Shongo during his study days. During the period of the independence war, he was the Rajakar. And later, during the final days of the war, he played a leading and important role for the Al Badr and masterminded the killing of the intellectuals and actively participated 
in the execution of the most of them. Both of them absconded soon after the war of independence was over. The first one, I mean the Ashraf Zaman Khan is in USA now and the second one is living in UK. Regarding the procedural history, I'll be very brief. Two officers of the investigation agency, I'm not naming them for the uh, sake of security, the two officers of the investigation agency of the International Crimes Tribunal being empowered under Section 8, Subsection 1 of the International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973. Uh, then they started investigation against this, these two accused persons uh, on 25-9-2011 they started their investigation and then uh, the main focus of the investi investigation was uh, with the offenses into their alleged involvement with the offenses abduction, confinement, torture, murder and genocide committed under section 3 subsection 2 of the ICTA after proper investigation on the basis of both the oral and documentary evidences they have submitted their investigation report to the Chief Prosecutor of the International Crimes Tribunal on 10-12-2012 and subsequently on uh, I think April the prosecution submitted the formal charge in Tribunal number 2. Now I will hand over the mic to my uh, senior colleague uh, Mr. M Ziad Al Malum. Uh, before uh, Malum Bhai uh, starts his speech, uh, let me just interrupt for just one second. Uh, we just uh, heard all the charges against uh, Chaudhry Mainuddin and Ashrafu Jaman Khan. And just to clarify one point, uh, these were basically all the charges against them. And uh, whether or not they truly committed those crimes or not are yet to be seen. And that's what the ICT is there for and ICT will decide whether they were guilty or innocent. So with that being said, we're going to go back to Malum Bhai and we will uh, uh, kindly ask him to continue. Uh, Malum Bhai, uh, please continue. After uh, receiving the investigation report, uh, before preparing the formal charge, on uh, careful scrutiny, prosecution satisfied and convinced that Ashrafu Jaman Khan and Chaudhry Manuddin both are accused of the same offense committed in the course of the same transaction. So may be charged and tried at one trial for and every charge, every such offense. Rules and procedure 36 evidently guaranteed the same and accordingly under rule 35, tribunal proceed to hear the case in accordance with the rules and procedure and under section 10 of the act. On 11 4 13, the prosecution team headed by me along with my colleague prosecutor Shahidu Rahman, A.K.M. Saifu Islam, Razia Sultan and Tapul Bol submitted the formal charge of abduction, confinement, torture, murder and genocide committed under section C to A of the ICT Act before the Tribunal 2 and against Asabu Zaman Khan and Chaudhry Manati. Accordingly, under the provision of the ICT Act, along with the rules and procedure, tribunal have taken cognizance against the, them and was pleased to issue an warrant of arrest under the later provision of the Rule 22. And after getting the compliance report, the return on SART from the Inspector General of Police of Bangladesh. Now, tribunal proceeded uh, in absentia. Tribunal further was passed an order under Rule 31 to publish a notice in two daily newspapers in English and Daily Star and another in Bangla, Daily Jonakonto, asking Ashraf Uzzaman Khan, Chaudhuri Manuddin, to appear before the tribunal on the date fixed therein. Despite publication of the notice in above mentioned daily newspaper, Ashraf Uzzaman Khan, Chaudhuri Manuddin, fails to appear before on the fixed date and time. Tribunal has reason to believe that there are, they are absconded so that Ashtabha Zaman Khan and Chaudhuri Manuddin cannot be arrested and produced before the tribunal. There is no immediate prospect for arresting them and in accordance with under Rule 32, tribunal pass an order trial of abscond Ashtabha Zaman Khan and Chaudhuri Manuddin 
shall commence and be held in absentia. Now, I would like to clear why joint charge uh, with Ashwabuddin Khan and Chaudhuri Manitin. In total, 15 charges have been submitted against Chaudhuri Manitin and Ashwabuddin Khan by the prosecution before the tribunal. Most of the charges include crimes against humanity under Section 32A of the ICT Act and C of the ICT Act, abduction, confinement, torture, murder, and genocide. As I have said earlier, the mastermind and participated individually in the execution of the most progressive intellectual of 1971, who by their writings or by their speech or through their works were inspiring the Bengali people to fulfill their long cherished dream of an independence of Bangladesh. They have been charged for abduction, confinement, torture, murder, as crimes against humanity and genocide for the following victims, namely Sirajuddin Hossein, journalist, on 10th December 1971, Seth Najmul Hawk, journalist, on 11th December 1971, A.N.M. Gulam Mustafa, journalist, on 11th December 1971, Nizamuddin Ahmed, journalist, on 12th December 1971, Selina Parvin, Selina Parvin, a uh, renowned journalist on 13 December 1971, Gyashuddin Ahmed, professor, renowned professor at Dhaka University on 12 December 1971, Dr. Shirazul Haq Khan, professor at Dhaka University on 14 December 1971, Dr. M.D. Mortuja, a renowned physician on 14 December 1971, Dr. Abul Khair among Dr. Poizul Mohi, Professor of the Dhaka University. Professor Rashidul Hassan and Professor Anwar Pasha the, on 14 December 1971. Professor Dr. Shantosh Bhattacharya, Professor of Dhaka University. Professor Mufazdal Haidar Chaudhuri, Professor of Dhaka University on 14 December 1971. Professor A.N.M. Munir Chaudhuri, a renowned uh, uh, writer, uh, thinker, and uh, uh, he was uh, expert in, in, in Bengali literature on 14 December 1971. Shoydula Kaisar, the, the renowned journalist and intellectual on 14 December 1971. Dr. M.D. Fadli Rabbi, one uh, was the professor and clinical medicine cardiology on 15 December 1971. Dr. Alim Chaudhuri, renowned eye specialist and doctors on 15 December 1971 and also was pleased to pass an order as under rule and procedure of the court state defense council shall be appointed to defend the Shrabu Jawan Khan and Chaudhuri Manudin. Tribunal appointed two state defense council after receiving views before the commencement of the trial furnished the tribunal a list of the witnesses intended to produce along with the recorded statement of such witnesses or copies thereof and the copies of the document which the prosecution intended to rely upon the support such charges in accordance with the section 9 subsection 3 of the act but the defense did not comply the obligation of section 9 subsection 5 a list of the witness for the defense if any along with the document or copies thereof which the defense intend to rely upon shall be furnished to the tribunal and prosecution at the time of the commencement of the trial on the asking of the tribunal why they have failed to comply the uh, uh, their obligation laid down in section 5 they both the defense counsel replied that none of the witness and relatives did uh, come forward and they did not uh, supply any documents for Ashrabu Zaman Khan and Chaudhuri Manuddin and as such they could not submit the documents who will be rely up upon in favor of the defense. Now I am handovering my uh, mic to my learned uh, colleagues, Mr. A.K.M. Saifurishnam Tarek. Hello, everybody. Uh, 
uh, in this step actually um, uh, before I start I like to uh, uh, I like to say hi to mr. Jamal Hassan I was in uh, the Washington uh, till 7th of uh, oh, this month. Thank you very much. And thank I was you looking for you. Hopefully you came uh, after that. Okay, okay sure. Um, and also I'm uh, thanking to uh, the moderator um, and everybody else. At this stage, actually, you see that when the accused is outside the country and a foreign citizen, uh, in that case, what we, do, we can do is uh, on the part of the prosecution, we can ask, uh, well, we, uh, we submit a petition to the uh, tribunal and uh, on the, upon the satisfaction of the tribunal, tribunal issues, uh, <clears throat> first of all, order for publishing the summon into the uh, two renowned, uh, very reported uh, newspaper, uh, one in Bengali and another in uh, English. And then uh, after the due date, uh, given the due date to appear before the court, if they fail, and also, as my, uh, my colleague says, that if they fail or fail to represent them uh, in the tribunal, at that time, the tribunal will take action for issuing a warrant of arrest. Now, in this case, a warrant of arrest, that means the register of the tribunal will be proceeding uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh, or as an independent body, they can proceed towards the embassy of uh, USA in Dhaka and uh, eventually the Dhaka embassy, Dhaka uh, US embassy will again go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then Ministry of Foreign Affairs will communicate to the embassy of Bangladesh in Washington DC in case of uh, Mr. A and um, to, the, to the embassy of uh, Bangladesh in the UK for that uh, subject. Now from there on the embassy will proceed uh, to the respective countries, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the State Department having the specific desk to proceed on with the local. Uh, before they go for local aspect, what they do is they want to satisfy themselves with all the documentations that uh, this person is really that need to be questioned about that and they will uh, do their needfuls. Now here we have two aspects. One is the tribunal, how they are uh, proceeding on the part of the tribunal's office and then that has to be taken care of properly by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh and then after that the, the embassy in that respective country need to be uh, carried on uh, very particularly with all those niches uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the state government, state uh, department of that country. Now when this goes to the embassy of Bangladesh. There is the thing that how they are going to deal with, and whatever they need, they need to they need to uh, ask for the feedback very rapidly, and also neck to neck they need to uh, go with the uh, that country's uh, local body. Uh, whenever the warrant of arrest is going there, the warrant is there. At that moment, is nothing with us. Is all about their the uh, their conditions. We need to fulfill with their conditions only. And also, there is a, our government and their government should be corroborating and sitting together uh, for this uh, thing. So that's a state level agreements they need to have. The extradition treaties are not there, but there are other uh, options, other, uh, other programs are there that on, the, on which uh, we don't want to go in detail about right now. Uh, but that can be done, but that's in a state position the country to country position that they need to take care of it. I'm done with this uh, subject matter. Now we are ready for the question and answers. Ryan, uh, could you please turn your mic on please? Oh yes. Thank you very much Mr. Uh, Saiful Islam Tarek. Uh, it is indeed an, uh, an honor for us that uh, three of our honorable prosecutors has took time off today to join us in this in this meeting, and we now have a better understanding of the uh, process uh, and 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 the steps ahead uh, and the procedures uh, for possible extradition if that happens. Uh, we thank you in particularly. We are very grateful uh, we are, uh, for for this informative presentation. Actually, we have a couple of questions. Uh, let me start with one. Uh, uh, let me start with one, uh, and I would address to the prosecutors, uh, and, and anyone can answer that. Uh, 
Uh, we all know that it is commonly said uh, by the lawyers from the defense team. Uh, they say that the ICT, uh, the tribunal uh, the justice process, is politicized. Uh, now, uh, now our question is: since uh, Chaudhary Mainuddin or Ashraf Jaman Khan, uh, who are now alleged uh, and, uh, and uh, alleged uh, allegedly before the ICT tribunal, uh, since, uh, since 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 none of them are actually political opponents of the current government. Uh, don't you think that actually invalidates the theory that the, the process is politicized? What do you think? Well, uh, this question is, has been coming up from the very beginning, uh, from the uh, region side. Uh, the question is, when we look into the profile, or the crime profile of those persons, so what they did during uh, in the year 1971, uh, whether they are part of any political party or yes or no, yes or no. But uh, it is something that they did the crime at that time. They have we have the old evidence and records. Uh, none of these adjudications uh, are taken care of uh, for a political purpose. Eventually, what happened is they did their misdeeds in 1971, and they took the shelter under a political party of the same minded, like-minded. So it's nothing political. It is uh, this trial. This trial is just for the uh, persons or accused in our definition in 1973 Act as an accused. Um, I will say that it's nothing political. Uh, it is for their crimes that they committed during 1971, the atrocities they took the part, they took part into the uh, systematic and a planned attack uh, that happened on Bengali Bengalis uh, during 1971. So it's only for their misdeeds, nothing else. Uh, but do you think uh, it invalidates the theory that uh, uh, that this is a politicized process? Because none of the alleged individuals, uh, Chaudhary Munuddin and Ashraf Jaman, none of them are members of opposition. Uh, uh, what do you think, uh, uh, Mr. Taposh? I think since, as you have said, uh, the question is very clear that whether these no, uh, this theory that they are political opponents and that's why they are getting tra tried is does not apply towards these two person because uh, as my uh, senior colleague has said very clearly that they are living first of all they are living far away from this country they were even though they were involved with jamaat islami and uh, al badr and their student wings in 1971 now right now they do not have any involvement whatsoever with these uh, opposition political parties. So I would say these two, as we have presented, that these two are the chief executor of this intellectual killing. These two single-handedly, or I, I, I may say double-handedly, masterminded all these plans and they executed very systematically. And uh, as soon as the tribunal to passes the charge framing order, you will see the narration of the events. The, the narration of the events or the process, the method they have followed is so identical in every case that uh, there is no chance, I would say, that there is no chance not to try them. And also, uh, I should not prolong but I would support that this theory this defense theory that they are getting persecuted as opposition political party activists does not uh, do not apply to these two persons thank you uh, thank you very much uh, 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 we have actually one more question uh, uh, for you uh, you have explained uh, that the tribunal is proceeding uh, uh, with these two individuals trying them in absentia and, uh, and lawyers have been appointed by the state. Uh, our question is uh, how competent these state appointed lawyers are, or what support they are being provided with uh, from the government and from other government agencies. Uh, is there any cause for concern or, or we, should, uh, we should talk about? Uh, first of all, both of the 
State defense lawyers are the lawyers of Bangladesh Supreme Court. Number two is both of them are already involved in, like one of them were involved with the case of Bachu Rajakar. He was representing uh, Bachu Rajakar or I should say Abul Kalam Azad. And another one is conducting the case of Salauddin Kader Choudhury. So you see, both of them already know the rules and procedures and the act in and out because they are defending two, defend, uh, two accused persons already. So I, should n I do not think there are, should be any questions should be raised because uh, uh, they are enough comp competent as Supreme Court lawyers. And then again, if you say that this is a very specialized law and uh, spe specialized uh, jurisdiction or jurisprudence, uh, I should. Um, you can see that since they are already conducting other cases, they already know, they are aware of the, uh, I, I would say, specialty of this jurisdiction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, we can, uh, uh, we, got, we, we got the answers and uh, we can move on to, to our next presenter today. Uh, I hand over the, I'm handing over the mic to Ruman uh, to, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Rahana uh, Our next guest is a fellow ICESF member, Barrister Shali Farhad. Please welcome Mr. Shali Farhad. Thank you. Um, good evening to the speakers in Dhaka, and um, good afternoon or good morning to whatever, whichever applies to your part of the world. Now, I have been asked to deal with the legal points regarding extradition uh, of an accused from both the United Kingdom and the United States of America. Now, I have a lot to deal with, so I'll be very, pre I'll be very swift. But at any point, if you feel that there is something that you would like some clarification on, please feel free to stop me at that point so that I can respond to your query or any information that you may require. Dealing first with the uh, issue of uh, Chaudhary Moinuddin, as you know, uh, the, the prosecutors have been kind enough to tell us that they are, that person, the alleged um, offender, is currently residing in um, United Kingdom. So we will have to look at the law, of the British law, which deals with extradition. The primary law that Britain has for extradition is the Extradition Act 2003. And that act uh, basically uh, divides uh, other countries into two categories. Uh, Bangladesh specifically falls under category two. Now, being a part of a category two country means that there are certain substantive uh, hurdles that has to be crossed before we can actually move into the procedural part. The first hurdle that Bangladesh has to cross is we'll have to show that there is a prima facie evidential case against the alleged offender. Now, this is a very typically British quintessential test, uh, which requires us to see whether there is enough evidence against someone uh, to uh, merit a response from the alleged offender. Now, the, the uh, prosecutors have been kind enough to tell us the information based on which the charges have been laid. Uh, the charges have not been formally fo uh, framed yet. Uh, we know that it is on the 24th of 24th of June. But from the information which has been given by the investigator in its in his report, uh, I feel uh, as a as someone who has studied uh, the British criminal justice system that we do have enough evidence to say that we have a prima facie evidential case against the alleged offender. So I'll move on to the next hurdle that we'll have to cross, which is that <clears throat> we can move on to the procedural part now, actually, because I, I've decided to skip some of the legal points as I felt that these are not that much relevant to our present case. Now, first of all, Bangladesh has to make a extradition request to the United Kingdom. And we already heard the procedural part as to what needs to be done regarding the, the, on the diplomatic front from Bangladesh's part. I'll tell you uh, what the decision makers will be looking at. 
after we make the request, the formal request of extradition, and that has to be made to the Secretary of State for the Home Department, that is the British equivalent of our Home Ministry. Uh, the Secretary of State, uh, if he or she finds that the request is valid, that is, there is no uh, legal bar to a request being sent from a country, will refer the case uh, to a judge. And the judge will hold a substantive extradition hearing. Now, this is the hearing at which the judge will look at two main points. First of all, whether there is any statutory bars for extradition not being granted and whether the extradition is compatible with the European Convention of Human Rights. Now for those of you and those present in Dhaka who are not aware of what the European Convention of Human Rights is, it is an international instrument that Britain entered into in 1957 which has delayedly um, incorporated into their domestic legal structure by the Human Rights Act 1998. And the judge in question, in dealing with the extradition request, will have to see that the country which is seeking the extradition, which is Bangladesh, whether the accused or the alleged criminal, when being sent to the uh, country seeking extradition, will get a, a fair trial uh, under Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. I will not go into um, the uh, arguments which might be raised by the councils representing uh, the alleged offender in that hearing, but presumably uh, uh, the objections which might be raised from uh, that side would principally uh, rest on Bangladesh's general reputation for human rights protection, uh, which in all uh, frankness uh, is not completely clean. I would say that there are some issues about our human rights culture which might be seen as um, not up to the standards uh, of human rights which are usually uh, enjoyed by the British citizens. And the fact that the British courts take uh, the uh, issue of uh, human rights very seriously uh, can be seen from the uh, long and arduous uh, extradition uh, 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 drama which uh, surrounded the uh, deportation of um, Abu Qatada, the radical Islamist cleric. Now, I said that I will not be going into much about the human rights point. So, provided that we can satisfy the judge, the extraditing judge, extradition judge, that uh, the accused will in fact get a fair hearing, uh, after crossing that hurdle, the, the matter would be sent back to the Secretary of State, who will now have to decide whether there are any reasons for refusing extradition. Now, presumably, um, since there are a lot of factors which a Secretary of State will have to cover, I will just point out the one factor which is relevant in our case, which is, um, according to Section 94.1 of the Extradition Act 2003, no um, um, accused can be sent back to a country uh, which is requesting extradition if he or she could be, will be, or has been sentenced to death. Now the ICT Act 1973 uh, allows for the capital punishment or death penalty as the highest punishment. Britain uh, as part of its human rights obligations and in fact, even before it entered into uh, the European Convention of Human Rights, had abolished the death penalty. Uh, the European Union um, as a whole, the whole region, uh, has a particular aversion towards the death penalty. So this is a, 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 a potential uh, legal point which will give rise to some political questions. Because although a person who can or will face the death penalty uh, cannot be extradited. Uh, there is, however, an exception um, stated in Section 94, Subsection 2 of the Extradition Act, which says that if a Secretary of State is satisfied after receiving an ex assurance, a written assurance, from the country seeking extradition that the 
person will not be imposed with any death penalty or if it is imposed it will not be carried out then the Secretary of State can consent to extradition. This essentially means that if Bangladesh wants a realistic shot at uh, bringing back the alleged offender from UK and who is to the best of my information a British citizen Bangladesh will have to concede that it might have to give up its right to seek the death penalty for this particular offender. Now I do realize that this will give rise to some uh, political uh, questions, uh, principle uh, among which is, is it justified uh, uh, or is it in fact fair that we should give up our right uh, to seek the highest punishment possible under the law, especially given the uh, seriousness and magnitude of the alleged offenses. Uh, as the uh, third prosecutor had so um, eloquently put that these are not um, ordinary crimes, these are, sorry, uh, it was the second uh, prosecutor. I'm sorry, but I think we're facing some technical difficulties. Uh, the, Dhaka, uh, the Dhaka venue has uh, just gone offline. So if you could just bear with us for uh, just, just a couple of minutes uh, until they come back online, then we'll continue from there. Uh, uh, actually, Dhaka venue is back, so should we try okay. going back okay. to Dhaka? Let's, let's go back to Dhaka then, yes. Sure. Uh, Farhad, can you hear us? Uh, uh, yes, can I can you. hear you clearly, Ryan. But can you please confirm till which part of my uh, presentation you were able to hear? Uh, we heard up till about two minutes ago, two three minutes ago. So, we, yes. So we, I, I didn't cover much after two uh, two minutes uh, before. Okay. I so if you would like to round up, then please go ahead. Is there any part which you would like to repeat me? Which you would like me to repeat? Uh, I, Farhad, I think the last thing that we heard from you were, was that you were explaining uh, how the government can take an undertaking that uh, they are not yes, going to be uh, getting the, the highest punishment and whether or not that will be fine with the population of Bangladesh to mm -hmm. get into certain, such agreement with, uh, with the British government. Correct. Yes, actually that takes care of my uh, presentation on the UK extradition law part. Now, the fact that I mentioned the death penalty and highlighted the issue was that uh, recently, uh, not recently, but a month back, on the 2nd of May of 2013, uh, the, there was a story on the Daily Telegraph where AFP was quoted as speaking to uh, Jamaat's foreign counsel, Toby Kadri, who said that Bangladesh will be required to give an undertaking that Mr. Moinuddin will not receive the death penalty if the issue of extradition comes up. So presumably we can, uh, we can uh, bank on the fact or we can, um, we can rely on the fact that they will be hammering on the death penalty point if a formal request for extradition is made through the official channels as Mr. Tarek was just explaining a while back. So uh, right now I'll be taking questions on UK extradition law part if there is any question on this issue. Uh, actually, we have a couple of questions, uh, Farhad. Uh, let me start with uh, 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 one question. Uh, you said about the undertaking. Uh, what, what, what these undertakings are worth actually? Because we heard in the past that uh, with the extraordinary rendition cases, uh, when British government accepted uh, undertakings uh, uh, from Middle Eastern governments, that uh, terror suspects won't, will not be uh, will not be tortured. And that, that was criticized. So in light of uh, that undertaking, how do you see the death, uh, like uh, the undertaking on death penalty that if Bangladesh government gives uh, that, uh, that certain individuals will not be uh, uh, awarded death penalty? So do you think these undertakings have any value whatsoever? Uh, I think uh, the undertaking should be a substantial bargain for securing the desired outcome, which is in this case bringing this alleged criminal back home. Because if you uh, look at the wording of Section 94 of the Extradition Act, the Secretary of State does not actually have a general discretion to refuse extradition, provided that we meet the substantive and procedural criteria of bringing back the alleged offender, and we give the undertaking as required under Section 94, subsection 2, I think that is a big enough price for Bangladesh to pay for bringing back the alleged offender. And I actually think that Bangladesh 
might well start uh, as a starting point. We might actually start with thinking about a, a special agreement uh, with the United Kingdom. The fact that we fall under category uh, two as a category two territory is because we do not have any specific um, extradition treaty with the United Kingdom. The countries who do have specific extradition treaties fall under category one for whom all these legal tests which I uh, had outlined a while back do not apply. So presumably uh, uh, such limitations which are available as part of the statutory criteria will not be imposed if uh, we uh, proceed on a diplomatic front of entering into a bilateral agreement. However, I, I cannot uh, say that with certainty as I'm not an expert on that particular issue. Someone from someone who has substantial experience in uh, foreign service will have to uh, get shed more light on that issue. Uh, thank does you that answer your question, Rahan Bhai? Yeah, yeah, that, that does actually. Thank you for it very much. And, yes. Uh, and my, my next question is actually a related one, uh, and it is both uh, to to you, Parad, and, and, and our Honorable Prosecutors present in Dhaka. Uh, the question is, uh, we are wondering what kind of capabilities are involved uh, to initiate uh, such a such a proceeding in or, or a campaign, if you say, in UK. Uh, uh, what is the exact deal here? Do you think the government Bangladesh should seek specialized legal counsel in Britain by appointing a British firm uh, like to uh, to process the extradition? Uh, or, I or, think that if, yes, I, if I could answer that question before I hand over the mic to the prosecutors, London prosecutors, who I'm, I'm sure who will be able to shed more light on this issue than me. Uh, I think the, the brains that we have here in Bangladesh are good enough for us to explore uh, the extradition points. Uh, there is, uh, at this stage, I do not see any necessity of engaging any foreign councils or spending too much on that issue since we are uh, working with quite finite resources, especially these tribunals. However, uh, since the matter would definitely, uh, undoubtedly, uh, go to the level of uh, the Secretary of State, uh, and that when it reaches that level, and if the negotiations reach a deadlock, perhaps then we can seek the help of specialist negotiators who are, you know, uh, experienced in this particular matter. But I will be handing over the mic to uh, the prosecutors to see if they have anything extra to add on this point. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, Let's hear from our prosecutors. Um, well, for the extradition treaty, the country as a Bangladesh uh, need to uh, approach to the UK government. That's a state level decision. And um, from the tribunal or the prosecution, what we can do in a personal level, we can push that point. But the thing is, the state level decision need to be taken by the state and then process should be initiated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, um, and related department that, uh, you know, involved in Bangladesh. And uh, obviously the Ministry of Foreign Affairs need to take care of it, uh, you know, initiate and take the lead. And also the Embassy of Bangladesh in UK, that means in London, uh, they need to take care of it and they have to initiate it and they have to come up with the ideas and approaches and all those requirements that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs need to take, they have to, the embassy, the ambassador in the UK, uh, he really need to take care, uh, take uh, a, great deal, a great deal of uh, the effort to do this. And uh, he need to satisfy the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bangladesh also, that uh, how uh, we can do it, how uh, all the aspects in the UK need to be proceeded. Uh, he is the key person over there, and I hope that the all Bengali community uh, need to come with the demonstration against uh, uh, that person, the accused person, not to be there and appeal to the uh, UK government. It's not only the certain people or the prosecution or the lawyers will be. Uh, these all, all these cases uh, that all these cases are not the legal, not only limited in the legal field, but also in a social aspect in the community. They have to uprise. They have to go. They have to go with the demonstration as we have done in the United States also. So we have done a lot of demonstrations in front of the uh, State Department in uh, Washington D.C. Likewise, um, uh, you have to I I inside the U.K. for that person. You have to go through the congressmen if they have 
the, all those political parties, political leaders, and uh, go for the major demonstration. There is no other alternative to come up with these uh, issues. So uh, this is not a single-handed job. This is not the only Ministry of Foreign Affairs can do. They can do the process. They can do the process in the state level, but the issue need to uh, the issue need to be a public sentiment, a public demand in UK land. So that has to be taken care of by only these conferences. It cannot be done successfully. I think you know it is uh, very serious, and uh, we all together have to take care of it. Likewise. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, if I could just add one well, yeah, point. Please, please, please. Uh, with Mr. Tariq's. Uh, I agree with uh, the learned prosecutor that this does involve a very concerted effort on part of uh, all the stakeholders who have an interest to see that justice is being served, although um, after 42 years. Now, although I said that at this stage, I do not feel that there is a need to seek specialist advice. And I said that, and I stick with the point that we do have the brains uh, to explore the legal and political complexities which are involved in uh, realizing this mission. Nonetheless, if, if I could reach out to the people who are making the decisions in this regard in our government, I would say that it is high time that we do have a high-powered team, at least, comprising of our own members, uh, preferably someone who uh, has the ability to research on this area along with a, a one or, uh, or a couple of the prosecutors themselves uh, along with the representatives from the foreign ministry the home ministry uh, uh, all the people all the stakeholders who have an interest in this make at least a team on it uh, who, who can at least start the process uh, over to you Rahan Bhai. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, actually, uh, and we have one more question related to extradition, and and this is something we 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 have to ask you. Uh, do you think there can be any justice uh, uh, without the highest punishment? And a related question is: Can a government actually give such an undertaking uh, when we understand the tribunal is supposed to be independent? I, I think I will answer the uh, second question first. It, do this gives rise to some in, in, interesting jurisprudential points. Does a state have the uh, uh, authority to forego its right to seek uh, the highest punishment, especially given the magnitude and seriousness of the offenses? Uh, my, my answer is I'm, I'm not sure about it. Uh, I'll be very frank. Uh, this, is, this, this is a very difficult question to answer and will have to be answered from the highest levels of government. This is not something that could be said from the top of our head. And um, coming back to the first question that you asked, do you think that it is right uh, from my perspective, what I think about it? I think that um, formal measure of justice cannot be um, assessed by the availability of the death penalty. What if we did not have the death penalty in Bangladesh? We do have it, but we could we, it, it could have been the case that we did not actually have the death penalty in Bangladesh. That would not have given rise to any problems then. So, if the matter comes to the point where the bone of contention is simply the death penalty, I think I would strike the bargain. If I was in, in the decision-making process, I would strike the bargain of giving up the right at least to bring him back, make him face the trial, and if we can prove the allegation against him, go for the next best alternative which is a life imprisonment which in my personal opinion is no less um, no less a penal measure than the capital punishment in fact in my eyes it is actually more profound it gives the accused more time to contemplate on his crimes and the magnitude of them over to you Rahan Bhai uh, th thank you for uh, I, actually the one of the okay, prosecutors okay, okay. Let, let, let's uh, Mr. Moderator Rahan Bhai, in this case, uh, I will say the uh, the death penalty is not the only option. In this act, there is a subsequent, you know, order of uh, order of punishment can be given, a lifetime, and other things. So now the thing is, uh, this is not the only option. I want to strike in a bargain that this law, this act, is quite open. 
and it's not bounded only in the boundary of death penalty. It has got other options also. So there is no way we can just, you know, give up the chance. Thank you. Yes, Rohan Bhai. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think now, now it is very clear that the issue is about justice and the issue is about establishing uh, accountability. Uh, and, and the issue of punishment or whatever form it is in, that is a secondary one. And uh, it is very interesting that your answers were. Uh, now I, I, would, I would like to hand over the microphone to, to, to our other moderators because I, I think there are a couple, of, couple more questions to our other presenters as well. Uh, over to you, Ishtar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the questions I have uh, to start with is actually for Ms. Gita Segal um, in, uh, in London. The question that I have um, is, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, during your presentation, you mentioned the Hillsborough disaster and how the families had to struggle for decades to, uh, to, you know, to even get the government and the police to look into it once again and get them, you know, the proper, a step towards justice. We're still not there yet, but a step towards justice. My question to you is, what can we learn from that? And how can we work to generate similar action? Because this being a disaster, well documented in England, and lots of people there being directly affected, that versus our situation, how can we work to, you know, generate some awareness? Any points on that, please? Um, I think that's a very, very good question, and as I tried to indicate in my talk, that uh, whatever the legalities, and we've had the legalities and the processes laid out very clearly to us, um, those legalities, even if they proceed really smoothly, take a huge amount of time. And as I tried to indicate, we have not succeeded in this country, in spite of um, some of the evidence first being gathered and broadcast in this country, we have not succeeded in producing a large body of support for the idea of accountability for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide in Bangladesh. Um, in fact, uh, the um, Interparliamentary Committee on Human Rights uh, you know, demanded uh, uh, here in Britain, demanded uh, that they should be allowed to monitor the trials and were very critical of the Bangladesh government for not giving permission to go and monitor the trials. But at the same time as they wanted to monitor the trials, they were actually saying that there should not be trials, that the, 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 the trials are happening too long after um, the crimes were uh, committed and uh, there should be a process that is not retributive but uh, reconciliatory. Uh, which is an extraordinary thing to say. On the one hand, you want to access to monitor. On the other hand, you're actually, uh, uh, you know, even before you monitor, you come to a judgment that the process itself is wrong. Um, so this is what we're facing. This is from the Human Rights Committee of Parliament. There are some parliamentarians who have got the message that uh, the demand for accountability is a people's demand. It is uh, quite a rational demand and so on. And and um, the tribunal should go ahead. There are, there, the, there are key figures in the Labour Party and the Tories who do accept this, but they are very few compared to the ones who do not. Um, we do not have uh, strong support from any of the major human rights organizations. I think I should say there that sometimes their position is misunderstood. They will criticize uh, failings in the tribunal because that is their job. They're not, they, they never give a clean shit to anybody anywhere. And they actually have, um, in a way, been somewhat muted. I think people don't understand that when, when they say that a trial falls short of, in, short of international standards, it's not the same as saying it violates international standards. So, you know, it, they've not completely called for hold to the proceedings, but they have been very critical of the proceedings. So we don't have key figures on our side that we would expect to have on our side in order to mount the kind of campaign. For instance, there was around General Pinochet and trying him in this country. You know, over there the human rights organizations got together. There was a you know huge demand. There were interveners in the court, and so on. And I would say 
that it's a great mistake to leave British lawyers out of this process. Uh, because although obviously the process of whatever demands have to be made will be Bangladesh led, it's a mistake to leave them out of the process here. Uh, because uh, uh, I agree that the process has to be a social process and a process of, of gathering voices, but I fear we've been having demonstrations here a long time on both sides of this argument, and we, the side that is demanding justice and accountability, is not being heard very well. I think we have to be very clear about this. Let's not underestimate the problems that we face. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try the arguments, but it, we, we have a huge problem. And there's a problem of time because it's not just the procedure. Each stage of the procedure is going to be challenged and it will go through the court system in Britain and it will go through the European court and you know each stage wherever the government makes a decision will be challenged by the lawyers for the Jamaat. So right. and, who are not only lawyers but are running a public relations campaign. Uh, as well, a very effective public relations campaign. So, you know, that's what we're up against. And you know, money does talk. We can do without the money, but we, ha we do have to be clever about how we organize. It can't just be demonstrations. Um, excellent answer, excellent answer, very insightful. And um, I would just like to mention that this issue being the way it is, um, we have a number of questions uh, for various panelists. and. Um, at this point, I think it might be better just to uh, just to mention the questions first because they relate to the pre the individual presentations and bits and pieces to one uh, panelist uh, actually relate to something uh, that someone else can help with. So, well, one of the fundamental questions that came up uh, during uh, Mr. Farhad's uh, Barrister Farhad's presentation was how does the role of international agencies? Because he mentioned that Bangladesh is in category two. And uh, if the question that came up was how does the role of international agencies and the kinds of uh, reports they publish on, um, you know, human rights and other issues factor in? And along those lines, there's another question for you, Gita, which, uh, which um, asks, um, what was the role of um, Amnesty International during 1971, and what is their current role, and um, how far? I mean, how does it relate to the current trial process? And um, so that's one. So I'm, I'm, there are three parts that that kind of goes to three different panelists. So I'm mentioning that, and you can of course uh, discuss, and I will I will aid you in the process. So there's a question of how the role of uh, international agencies play in specific. How does Amnesty International's role come in here? And also another question is about the awareness, and that was for uh, Mr. Jamal Hassan. That question uh, mentioned uh, asks how should we work to educate the people in the West about the similarities between what has happened in the Holocaust and what has happened in Bangladesh in 1971 because we know that um, six million people were killed in concentration camps in six years and we lost three million lives in, in just nine months. How do we you know translate that knowledge? How do we educate them and how do, how do we get that through the international agencies and in very particular how does the role of Amnesty International here play? And what was their role? What did they do? I'll, I'll start with Gita. Um, well, the most international agencies, uh, well, by international agencies, I think you mean uh, human rights. Human rights agencies. International, yes. human, rights. international human rights organizations. Yes, yeah, because of course there are other agencies that are. Exactly. Uh, that, that was completely, um, yeah. I think what many people within Bangladesh don't realize is that the issue of the 71 war and, and the liberation and the genocide that took place during the war um, has completely fallen off international agendas. Around that time, at the time, it was a major international issue and anybody who opened a newspaper or was aware of anything knew about it. And with the concerts, it was one of the first examples of, or perhaps the first, uh, I'm not sure, of like pop music and so on. Uh, you know, making a political issue like that and the humanitarian crisis involved, uh, you know, a major mass popular issue, uh, you know, as he put it through the George Harrison concert for Bangladesh. All of that memory has largely been lost by the general public uh, in the West. And, th and that's one of the problems we face. There are a few older people who do remember it, but, you know, young people know nothing about that history. Um, what do the, the international organizations do? 
most of them did not comment on the issue of impunity for war crimes. Uh, so Amnesty didn't do very much at that time, and largely their concern was for the uh, 90 odd thousand prisoners of war and the conditions, and they were actually kept under Geneva, uh, Geneva Convention conditions, as far as I recall. Uh, but their concern was mainly for them and the return of those prisoners of war, and they didn't ever do any investigation of the substantive issues of um, uh, the massacres that had taken place and who had committed those massacres and who was responsible, whether the Pakistan army or the jabhat e Islami and other allies of the Pakistan army. Um, so, so, so that's amnesty, but it's also true of the other human rights organizations, uh, uh, Human Rights Watch or ICJ. ICJ in 1972 also did uh, a, a small report, but nothing of that has been followed up. So you have a major genocidal campaign that has never been subjected to human rights analysis by any major international human rights organization. And what we see actually is the strength, both the, the, the dilemma of the, the issue of accountability uh, in Bangladesh is that it has been strengthened uh, by being a national and an internal social justice campaign. It has received enormous popular support and strength from that, and it hasn't been hindered by the policies or programs of international organizations. So it has been a genuine mass movement internal to Bangladesh. That, however, has been also its weakness in being able to project itself outside the country, because it's seen as a nationalist issue or a party political issue, which I don't believe it is, um, rather than uh, a human rights issue. And I think, you know, that really is the dilemma, that we have to uh, work on the issue of impunity. I go into the second question of, you know, what are the links with the Holocaust, not just the Holocaust, but what are the links with Rwanda, what are the links with uh, Yugoslavia. I wrote an article for Open Democracy in which I said that the Bangladesh issue is a forgotten template of uh, 20th century war. You know, many of the issues of militias killing of both formal armies and militias, of you know the international involvement, or the holding back of international intervention, um, and so on, because of uh, various kinds of high politics, uh, you know, were repeated in later wars. Um, so these are the linkages that need to be made with people working on those issues, and I think we do have to talk to other sets of victims and other other um, other people who have fought for accountability in those cases. And um, that does mean that we need to be able to be understood, you know, beyond singular demands like uh, having the maximum punishment. Um, along those same lines, I mean, uh, you just said that there's this, I mean, they were mostly um, thinking about the prisoners of war and whether they're going to come back or not. So why do you think, I mean, they took such, an, uh, such a position? Because why is there no uh, never any mention of the actual people who suffered and and the right for justice for for you know for for their unfortunate death. Um, I I I I I don't know. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I'm reluctant to pass on individuals as responsible. But what it it, it is a major it it is a huge gap. And when I was yeah. at Amnesty International, I did actually show uh, the war crimes file, and I yeah. was trying to persuade. Um, the uh, legal department and the, and the department that worked on international legal issues, international justice issues, to simply write a letter to the attorney general in this country, which is the kind of thing that Amnesty actually does very well when they choose to do it. And I know they've done it, for instance, where there have been international warrants of arrest issued for various Rwandans, who in fact have only just been arrested. The warrants of arrest were issued many years ago. Um, and Amnesty wrote letters asking what had happened um, uh, to those warrants of arrest and was Britain going to act on them and so on. Now in this case at that time there was no international warrant of arrest so there wasn't that kind of um, compelling uh, reason from an external authority but you know they could have helped to kick start an investigation there are many things that could have been done but uh, I didn't feel that there was any political will internally to do it and I wonder whether uh, in any, any human rights organization has ever issued 
any concern about any leader of an Islamist party or any person who's connected with an Islamist party residing either in the US or in Britain. Let me give you an example that's completely separate from Bangladesh, but where there, there are common features which, which we should build on in terms of campaigning. In the 90s, um, the leader of the uh, Algerian Islamists had, had fled to the US and had sought refugee protection there and was about to be given refugee status. And a, a very brave feminist human rights lawyer called Rhonda Coppola worked with victims, Algerian victims, to try and get a case against him uh, under the alien tort law in, uh, in the US, which allows foreign perpetrators to be tried on US soil. That was a civil case. And she didn't succeed in getting that case. And one of the reasons was that there was that the um, Algerian Islamists were treated purely as victims of oppression by the state, and they were being tortured and uh, attacked by the state and so on. But they were not treated as people who were also perpetrators of mass atrocity, very similar to the ones that took place in Bangladesh. And she was actually attacked by human rights organizations for launching a case against this man, who the human rights organizations wanted to see purely as a victim of state oppression. And I think in the end, under refugee law and so on, they actually got him denied uh, refugee protection, but I don't think he was ever uh, excluded from um, the US. But it was a very lonely struggle for the victims in Algeria and for uh, Rhonda Coppolin, who was a brave lawyer um, acting at that time, uh, for working with the Center for Constitutional Rights at that time. Now the Center for Constitutional Rights in the US is one of the main uh, legal uh, voices I was going to say they, they defended Anwar al-Awlaki, but they didn't just defend him. They were, in a sense, promoting his politics by denying that he actually was, um, uh, that he did anything other than have inflammatory speech. You know, they, they denied his role as a senior al-Qaeda figure who was producing a magazine, uh, instructing people how to make bombs and so on. So today, the Center for Constitutional Rights, as we say in our book, Double Bind, uh, the, published by um, by the Center for Constitutional, uh, for, for the Center, the Center for Secular Space. Secular Space. My center has published a book called Double Bind: The Muslim Right, the Anglo-American Left, and Universal Human Rights, in which we look at the case of Amnesty International promoting a pro-Al Qaeda uh, public relations organization, Cage Prisoners, and Center for Constitutional Rights in America are working with the same organization. And indeed, Human Rights Watch has worked with them as well, and they still sign letters. So they actually take on and work with very closely the narrative of various kinds of Islamists. And I don't think that they have ever put their muscle behind any one case of any of the Islamists that have been sheltered in the US and UK. Uh, for instance, they could have said in the case of Abu Hamza and others, uh, they, you know, if they didn't agree, agree with extradition, say to George or Abu Qatada, they could have said, they could have mounted a campaign to have a and they never did that. So it's not just Bangladesh. There's a general problem with the way in which human rights organizations view um, Islamist individuals and Islamist groups. And they defend their human rights. But they never do the other argument and say, yes, they should not be subjected to torture. They should not be subjected to death penalty. But they should be subjected to extraterritorial jurisdiction and yeah. tried uh, wherever they are. And they, they have not mounted campaigns. They may say it in a sentence, but they don't mount campaigns or gather evidence or do anything that would be necessary to actually show how you would implement that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gita. Um, let me quickly go to Dhaka because uh, it's pretty late at night over there. So let me ask uh, a question that we received from online for Dhaka. The question was, uh, Dhaka, are you online? Just, just making sure. Can someone from Dhaka please confirm? Yes, we are online. Okay, we can hear you. you. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, why is there a a single uh, case against um, alleged uh, war criminals, uh, Chaudhary Munuddin and Ashraf uh, Zaman? I mean, why are they being tried together by the ICT? Uh, because would it not be a better idea to try them separately, given that they live in different countries with different legal regime and you know different different definitions and different positions on uh, various aspects of the law.
first of all, the reason is why uh, they are the uh, both are the same team members, and uh, most of the of the crimes that they did is together in the same spot. So it's uh, very much um, uh, in a in a very better shape if we go together. Otherwise, it will be uh, um, like uh, a, right. Uh, it will be in a, in a difference of uh, proceedings and a different uh, uh, two different uh, um, uh, cases will be proceed in different times and uh, it may lose its uh, uh, the uh, consignments and uh, matching uh, aspects. So. Uh, we have uh, studied those both the cases uh, individually first, and then uh, we come up together. And we got the investigation stage was done separately, and we come up uh, the most uh, like uh, seventy percent of the aspects are together. Uh, so though both of them went to the same spot uh, at the same time uh, most of the time, and uh, one was the executor and another was another position in the member, but they lead the same group for the same activities, same atrocities, same uh, intellectual killing in the same uh, spots. So that's the reason. And we don't want to waste any uh, time, uh, the tribunal's time and the prosecution's time. So uh, it was well, um, uh, it was actually well and uh, detailed to discuss before we go for this decision in our boards and uh, all, the, all other corners give us the consent to do that like that. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Prosecutor, for um, you know detailing the alleged crime uh, that has been committed and what the investigation reports say. So uh, do you, uh, another part of the question was, will, will this be any problem if um, there is ever a time when, as we have discussed uh, in, in, you know, before, that if there is ever a time when we might have to strike a bargain or make a compromise on uh, you know, death penalty and what will happen because one person lives in UK where death penalty is not allowed and the other person lives in US where death penalty is allowed. Will that give rise to any complications? Uh, well, actually, uh, this aspect we have discussed a little bit before yeah. also. Yeah. Uh, this is the trial that happening within the Bangladesh. And uh, as per uh, Section 3.1, see anything that crime that happened within Bangladesh whoever did that means this person may be a foreigner may be a Bangladeshi may be whoever it is so it doesn't matter now the question is the bargain uh, bargain with UK bargain with USA to satisfy them uh, but uh, in the process of the trial in the process of adjudication there is no difference in between two um, in a section 4.1 uh, gives the equal footings of the doer and who did and accompanied, and are staying at the same time. Say, uh, so that, that also given the equal footing, and if somebody is uh, having a leadership within the group at the same time while he is present and doing the work, so in that case, 4-2 will be attracted, and he will be given the uh, aggravating factor for sentencing, but the basic thing is the same. Thank you, thank so you so much. So there is no difference between these two uh, in a specific this uh, case. In the, in the eyes of the trial, trial. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone have anything to add to that? Um, uh, I believe uh, Brian Rashid has a question. Um, I will just ask him to present that. I have a question for uh, Mr. Jamal Hassan. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned the in, in incident where uh, where the office of office of special investigation led by Eli Rosenbaum. He actually sent a letter to the Bangladesh government a couple of years ago. Uh, and that was uh, that letter was sent to uh, Shamsul Islam Tuku. I understand. Uh, no, it so was uh, because I do not. Uh, I mean, I found that actually in a in a newspaper called Shangbad. Yes, I, I, I mean that, because because that, I can really tell. I mean, I mean, this must be a classified information. But yeah, unfortunately, it was disclosed by Bangladesh media. I don't know how. It was. Uh, I think Eli Rosenbaum probably sent to. Uh, they then uh, uh, state minister. I mean, maybe he's still uh, active. Uh, home, home affairs state minister Shamsul Haq Tuku. But what happened? Shangbad uh, paper disclosed that it was in the text, and um, probably Mr. Rosenbaum didn't know until uh, News Bangla online publication uh, in Virginia. Uh, they uh, they basically uh, translated in English, and it came to the knowledge of uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, and he was. 
totally outraged how it was leaked. So that much I can tell because later on we found out that Mr. Rosenbaum was very upset, you know, about the leakage. So this much I can tell. And uh, subsequently, uh, uh, News Bangla, they, they faced a legal notice, right? Oh, it was very interesting because I am an, I'm an advisor you know, of the editorial board, actually. And I know how the proceeding. Rahel Ahmed um, was the editor at the time. Uh, if I could happened. just interject for one second, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I just would like to thank uh, uh, the honorable prose uh, prosecutors in Dhaka. It's, it's closing to, uh, it's almost midnight over there, so they will have to leave. Uh, I would like to thank them on our behalf uh, for attending, and we will continue on the discussion. I will, I will, will come back to Mr. Jamal Hassan. But I would, I, on behalf of everyone um, here in ICSF and everyone in attendance, uh, we wanted to thank you, the the honorable prosecutors for taking the time out and attending uh, this seminar. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'm going yes, back to that story. Yes, so yes. it was a very interesting, a revealing story about Ashraf Zawn Khan's legal maneuver. Uh, he probably missed somehow the Sangbad, maybe that his network, obviously he's connected to Jamaati network undoubtedly, but somehow he did not know that Sangbad uh, paper, Delhi Sangbad has published the story and that, you know, it was a very, you know, it was a very vivid description and about his uh, alleged atrocities and all this. Anyway, when News Bangla published a summary of that story in English, and uh, his New York, uh, definitely his New York uh, associates of confidence probably alerted him. And his legal team has served in notice and, uh, to the News Bangla editorial board that unless they apologize, they, they, would, they are going to face a lawsuit. So I remember Mr. Rahan Ahmed, one of our ICSF members, Mr. Rahan Ahmed from Virginia actually, he, he called his attorney and his attorney basically communicated with the attorneys of Ashraf Zaman Khan. Do you know what happened? Nothing. Ashraf Zaman Khan team basically retreated. So, so that also proves it was, a, in, in a sense, before the ICT was involved, that happened. It, it's a couple of years before the ICT's involvement, ICT's prosecution started. So that was a story behind story. So that was Ashraf Zaman Khan's legal battle against um, but on the other hand, I can tell you this didn't happen. I mean, in UK, the situation is very, uh, I mean, very odd and very bleak. I, when I say about the war crime file, as I understand that um, Channel Four probably had to submit to their pressure. Similarly, Guardian paper had to submit, as far as I understand. The Guardian paper published something derogatory, quote unquote, about Manutin. And I think the England, in England, uh, I, what I understand, the Islamist groups. Are, are much more powerful. And uh, obviously, Mr. Moinuddin, I, I saw a picture of Mr. Moinuddin with uh, Prince Charles. So apparently, he has got his lobby and he has got his money. Money talks, as Ms., I think Ms. Segal probably said. And then this is the situation. But in USA, uh, I can say they are not in, in the upper hand. I'm talking about the alleged war criminal and his Islamist cohorts. Uh, thank that, you, Mr. Jamal Hassan. Uh, You're most welcome. And, and it, it, it sounds like that sometimes uh, uh, the law of defamation or the defamation actions, they're being used strategically to silence activists, uh, which is very Definitely. unfortunate. And uh, we're glad that we, we have activists uh, who are working for 1971 who, are, who cannot be silenced so easily, which is a great relief. Uh, uh, we actually have uh, a few more questions. Uh, one question from Toronto. Uh, Mr. Hassan Mahmoud actually asked Mr. Jamal Hassan. Uh, Mr. Jamal, sure. can you actually uh, uh, can you just say a few words about uh, about that famous diary of Ashraf Jamal Khan? You you wrote about it. Oh, that that article actually was a kind of a, what can I say? It was a kind of a uh, epicenter, or it, it it was kind of a black hole of all all uh, agency uh, law enforcement agencies of USA because that's how NYPD got in touch and you know and. The, Obviously, FBI in touch with me, but uh, but, but uh, it also shows the uh, power of internet. And uh, Mr. Hassan Mahmoud, if you ask about the diary, I thought uh, I, there was a documentary in Bangladesh television, and uh, Mr. Hassan Mahmoud, I think, supplied the tape, video tape of that particular document in Bangladesh television. That particular program showed the pages of the diary. That was the only thing. We don't know where the diary is. Even OSI showed interest one time, but even then, the diary may not make any sense at the moment. 
because some then obviously you have to get Ashraf Zaman's kind of handwriting maybe in Bangla and get a handwriting expert but that is a very complicated that might lead to a very complicated situation rather than getting a witness uh, you know against his alleged crimes so but the, there was an existence of the diary the diary was mentioned in I think Ekaturir Khatok Dalal Ke Kothai by the Mukti Juddha Chetana Prakash Kendro uh, back in 88 I think that book was published and in, in the diary was mentioned the diary's pages were shown in a video and that's why uh, I wrote the article on the diary so you know because di the diary story also on the web before I wrote the article so that much I can say uh, thank you, Mr. Jamal Hassan. Uh, we heard about the Office of uh, Special Investigation that is located in USA, uh, which works under the Justice Department. Uh, right. uh, previously, that that department it was it was a department for Nazi hunting, uh, and then they right. later changed the mandate and 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 looked uh, uh, looked looked to other other war criminals. Uh, Correct. Uh, actually, my question to actually both uh, you, uh, Mr. Jamal Hassan, and, and Geeta Sagal from London, uh, are you are you aware of any such institution in in England, which can be, we can say counterpart like USA? I didn't hear the I didn't hear the end of the question, Rehan. Uh, well, uh, can we compare any institution in Britain that can uh, that works in the same way like OSI of uh, USA? I I think the latest thing on the war crimes unit, which was very tiny, uh, was a police unit, was that it was actually closed down. They closed it so, down. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe my information is wrong there, but I don't think so. So, in fact, we're in a very, very difficult situation where there, there is no, uh, there is no equivalent, and there's no equivalent to say the Simon Wiesenthal Center, that um, you know has tirelessly hunted um, uh, Nazi war criminals, you know, across the world. And uh, you know, found them under various hidden identities and this and that. We don't, we don't have that. It doesn't mean that we can't do the work, but it does mean that there, there there's no, um, you know, uh, automatic place we can go. There's no template for what we have to do, except a huge amount of evidential work. And I would say that actually, that's one of the, you know, that is one of the tasks that's still before people um, uh, is actually. Finding and collecting, and uh, you know uh, the, the evidence that's there, because the tribunal itself is under huge resource pressure, and uh, uh, also has been put under a lot of time, you know, pressure of time. So I, I think I think there, there there are major things still to be done. I can add one thing, Rehan. Miss Segal mentioned the Simon Rosenthal Center. Which is basically it's private, a private entity. It is not exactly a federal agency, but it was an individual, Mr. Wilsonthal, who recently died. I mean, a couple of years ago. So that was activism, uh, like your ICSF, our ICSF is doing. So grassroots activism. I, 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 I do not know if any, any other Simon Wilsonthal center, center in UK, but USA has such obviously, and also it, it, it has the all support of American Jewish community. Who, have, who are also a very powerful minority, especially in the case of Nazi hunting, they play a significant role. So, I, I mean, that, that I, can, I can add. So, which means that uh, it, 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 it is a case for our civil society that we need. Exactly, we need exactly. exactly. Our organizations and we, we, and and in, in this case, I add one thing also that, Amer uh, that American, uh, Armenian American. Other than the Jewish community, I mean, the American also very active in the genocide uh, issue, and obviously, you know, that many times they, it went to the Congress, and obviously that genocide occurred many years ago, hundreds of years ago. But Armenian, some people say the Armenian American, the Armenian diaspora in USA is more powerful than the Armenian government. So I, I'm waiting to that day when Bangladeshi community in a, we'll across the, the globe will be more vocal. Yeah. Uh, we are actually nearing uh, uh, the end of this uh, seminar. Uh, uh, I was just wondering if there is an, any question from any of the venues. Uh, anyone? I have. I can I ask you one question, uh, Mr. Rehan Rashid? Which which we are skip, we are missing exactly about the death penalty issue. One one problem can come because you know there is a chance, there is a high chance, a family government may fail. You know, because in, in uh, un unfortunately in 1996, 
the Omili government then were so uh, so confident that they would win the next election. It didn't happen. This time also, Omili Omili government might fail, and then what will happen? I ironically, if if someone we put in the death penalty, they might be released also because in Bangladesh, what we are saying, the legal proceedings a lot of times uh, become uh, the, the puppet of uh, a, a very fragile segment of politicized situation. So politics sometimes has the last shots. So I do not know exactly how it will. Imagine that tomorrow BNP Jamaat Axis comes to power. I do not know, even in death penalty, even in, uh, you know, in life imprisonment, what would be happening to the convicted uh, criminals who are already convicted? So I, I do not know. That was it. I was wondering about that. Jamal Hassan, those were actually really uh, very pertinent questions. And we, uh, we hope to discuss those questions in, in much more detail and much more depth in, in our next seminars. Uh, because these questions need to be answered, and I, I'm sure that all activists uh, uh, in the world, including in Bangladesh, uh, uh, they also need some kind of direction, some form of intellectual direction. Uh, uh, thank you, Jamal Sanbhai. Uh, thank I you. think I, I, I'll, I'm now, uh, I can say that there, there are no, no more questions here from any other, any other venues. So we can move on to, uh, uh, to, to San Jose, uh, so that we uh, to thank. Uh, the thank you note. Uh, or Roman, uh, are you going to present the thank you note? Uh, yes, I, I can do the closing. Uh, okay. So basically, uh, as I was saying, it was wonderful. Uh, it was very informative and uh, it was a very lively discussion. Uh, we would like to thank everyone for your participation and um, ICSF will continue to host these types of seminars in the future. Uh, with among many things uh, with the aim to uh, you know discuss about the topics and educate everybody who is involved uh, we would like to thank everybody in every venue uh, who attended and special thanks to everyone who presented uh, and who shared their insights with us and your participation is key to making <clears throat> not just the program but the <clears throat> excuse me but the entire process of seeking justice uh, very successful and we hope that Eventually, uh, we will be successful in our fight against the forces against justice. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, that there are lots of obstacles to work through, and some of them we have some control over, some we don't. And um, for some, we need to be united. For some, you need to be uh, educated. Together, we hope that someday uh, this campaign for justice will be successful. And with that, um, I would like to thank everyone for attending, and I wish you a very happy and prosperous life uh, until we meet again uh, and get a chance to discuss these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks.